Nabad annual report has been recently re released by Nabad, but unfortunately, I did not find a very comprehensive discussion on the same yet on YouTube. I thought for the Nabad students, it's very pertinent that a very comprehensive yet brief discussion on the annual report is carried out. In this report, I will be discussing everything that has been provided by Nabad under its annual report in under 20 minutes. So let's begin the analysis of NABAD annual report 2022-23. If we talk about the divisions that NABAD has created in structuring its annual report, then we see these following divisions. They will help us structure the annual report in our minds better. Firstly, analyzing the year, we will try and understand what has happened in the past years when it comes to agriculture as well as overall. The International Year of Millets has been declared recently. We will be talking about millets, sustainability in agriculture, which is in line with evergreen revolution, inclusive development, because development cannot be sustainable unless it is inclusive, rural infrastructure and rural finances. These have been specifically focused by NABAD, supervision by NABAD, which is one of the major functions of NABAD. Rural financial institutions, which includes regional rural banks and cooperative banks, what NABAD is doing to empower them. And finally, people and finances of NABAD, where we will be focusing on the finances only of NABAD, which is also very relevant for your interview part, especially. If we come to analyzing the year part, which is the first chapter in the annual report, then it mentions that India has gone through a poly crisis which means that there was a severe and mutually reinforcing shocks that we saw in India in the past three years. What are these shocks? First of all, we saw COVID-19 hit the country as well as the world. I don't need to explain on that. Food and energy crisis was witnessed not only by India, but also by the world because of the Ukraine war. Now, this crisis automatically transformed into high inflation for economies around the world and with high inflation we saw expensive borrowings big borrowings becoming more expensive why does that happen when inflation goes up monetary policy response is to increase interest rates on its lendings when it does that through policy rate changes automatically debt tightening happens which makes borrowings expensive and we are witnessing a climate emergency the first uh, example is COVID-19, we are witnessing a lot of uncertainties in the climate as well. All of this combines together to form a poly crisis for India especially as well as the world. What is the condition of global and Indian economy in financial year 23, that is 2022-23? When we talk about inflation, you can see here that inflation has been going down because of uh, cumulative reaction of countries around the world but a side effect of inflation going down is that the global growth has also gone down because when inflation goes up countries response the central banks response by increasing their policy rates when that happens inflation starts coming down but as a result growth is also affected and we can see these happening here you need to remember these numbers they can be asked in the examination Please memorize them. I'm giving you a trend here based on these numbers. If we see in India also, inflation went up uh, during the time of COVID especially, but it came down. It is still up because the oil prices have not reduced in India. Why is that? Because of the uh, higher oil prices at the end of Russia as well as Middle East. The growth in India has suffered because of this high inflation and the response of RBI in the form of monetary policy rate hikes. Okay, What is the condition of Indian agriculture in the past one year? The gross value added, uh, agriculture's contribution to gross value added is 22 lakh crore, which is about 15.1% of GVA. This can be asked in the examination. These kind of macro numbers are very, very important. The growth in agriculture is impressive, I would say, because agriculture historically has not seen such growth and we are witnessing them now. About anywhere between 3% and 4% is considered to be good growth rate for agriculture. When we talk about food grain production, the production of cereals 
which includes rice, wheat, as well as four cereals. This also includes maize, millets, etc., etc. This is about 303 million tons. We can add pulses to this, which does not form a part of cereals, about 27.5 million tons, and they combine together to form 330 million tons. This is the entire production of food grains in the country. The growth in pulses in the last five years is 6.3% per annum, which is very, very good considering that pulses are not considered a part of staple diet. We are still stuck on rice and wheat because of MSP, because of PDS system. These numbers are important. Again, I am also giving you a trend so that you find it easier to remember them. When we talk about, when we break down cereals, rice 135 million tons, wheat 112 million tons, coarse cereals about 55 million tons, 5.6% uh, growth in the last five years, which is very, very good. Coarse cereals includes millet, uh, whereas, and at the same time, various other uh, types of millets and types of cereals. For example, Jawar, Bajra, Ragi, these kind of cereals are included under coarse cereals. The total food grain production is about 330 million tons, 330.5. And this is something interesting. We see that sugarcane production is 494 million tons, much more than the entire production of food grains. Horticulture is expanding very fast. Why? Because of a lot of exposure and opportunity of exports in horticulture. That is the reason it is growing very fast. Milk production, 221 million tons. India is popularly called as the biggest consumer and production of milk, producer of milk in the world. And we still maintain that tag with a lot of production. We are witnessing stress in the cotton sector recently. There are two major reasons as per the annual report. This can be asked in the examination as well as interview. Number one, pink ballworm infestation. Please try and read on this infestation, pilk ballworm. This has been specifically mentioned, important one. Uh, because of this infestation, the productivity and production of cotton has gone down in the western part of the country. And second is 42nd rank in cotton crop yield. Yield is productivity per hectare. So our crop yield in cotton has been going down and it is at 42nd rank, which is also one of the major reasons that cotton production is down in India. Okay. When we talk about agriculture credit, institutional credit growth in the last five years has been 40.8%, which is impressive, which means more and more organized, formalized institutional loans are being taken by farmers and people in the farming sector. Crop loans have grown by 15.8% and term loans, which are long-term loans in the agriculture sector have also grown by 13.2%. These numbers are important. But more important thing is to understand that these are all in double digits, which is automatically a good news for the country for the future of agriculture. If we come to exports, then overall exports in the entire country, not only of agriculture, were 776.4 billion in 2023, which is a very good number. Merchandise exports, a part of that 451 billion. Agriculture exports are 52.5 billion less than 10% of overall exports. Agriculture contributes about 15% to GDP. Why should it not contribute about 15 to 20% to the exports from India? Therefore, agriculture exports are less. They can, there is a tendency, there is, a, there is an opportunity to increase them further, bring them to 15 to 20% of our overall exports. If we talk about infrastructure, we require an infrastructure investment, not only in agriculture, but overall in the entire country of about 1.4 trillion dollars. Major areas that need infrastructure investment are energy, roads and urban. These are the numbers given by NABAD and these are not isolated from agriculture. All of these directly contribute to the growth and development of agriculture as well. We are witnessing a very strong startup ecosystem in the country. We are third largest ecosystem in startups with about 99,000 startups which have been recognized by DPIIT, Department for Promotion of Industry and Internal Trade, as startups, they are certainly going to contribute towards the growth of the country in the years to come. A lot of these startups are in agriculture field. The numbers are not given by NABAD yet in the annual report. This brings us to the second chapter, which is millets for health and wealth. Very high chances that you will have a question coming from this area. 
what is the present condition of millets these are known for nutritional richness known for low water and input requirements as well as their climate resilience these are the three major advantages of millets for people as well as for the country but millet production was marginalized majorly due to green revolution which focused too much on rice and wheat and pushed down or forgot about coarse cereals and pulses in 1965 20% of our food basket consisted of millets but now only 6% of the food basket consists of millets this is purely because of over reliance and over dependence of the people on rice and wheat this can also be seen here if i can show you the numbers let me see if i can find them yes the demand for millets has been down in financial year 2022 we consumed or produced a total of 17.8 million tons of millets but the interesting part is here per capita consumption in 1960 was 30.9 kgs but this has dropped down to 3.9 kgs this means people are not consuming millets and that is why the focus yet again on millets by declaring it as international year of millets coming back let's jump to area and production of millets India is the largest millet producer in the world even today and it exports majority of its production why because consumption in India itself is very less second is china at a meager 9% very interesting fact in india it's it is gro grown primarily as a kharif crop in rain fed conditions where irrigation potential is not available in nine between 1951 and 2022 the area under millets has gone down why because of the focus on rice and wheat but the production has gone up our per capita consumption has gone down the area under millets has gone down but production of millets in india has gone up why because it's a rain fed crop which can easily be grown and therefore states like rajasthan maharashtra jahan pe drought padta hai sukha padta hai kafi barish kam hoti hai kuch regions mein there the production of millets is primarily done okay why what is the reason that land under millets has gone down number one margins under millets have gone down because of msp in wheat and rice margins for the farmer in wheat and rice is very high this automatically makes it less lucrative there is a short shelf life for millets therefore the risk of spoilage is very high so we still do not have cold storages which are required for storing millets uh, and if we have that automatically the demand as well as the supply of millets might go up urbanization as well as wheat and rice under pds because they fall under pds there is fall uh, a fall in per capita consum consumption of millets which means the demand for millets is also down which we've already covered so margins are low shelf life is uh, short and because we do not have enough cold storages there is a high risk of spoilage and the demand is also down because of over reliance on pds system as well as urbanization jaha pe we are pushing uh, rice and wheat more and more what is the state wise concentration of millets if we talk about area as i said rajasthan 35% of millet produced in india is grown in rajasthan second is maharashtra and then karnataka not important try and remember the first only very high chances of this being asked when we talk about production versus area then also rajasthan is the highest produce, producer uh, followed by maharashtra again if we talk specifically about bajra then also rajasthan is the highest product producer of bajra and in jowar maharashtra is the highest producer at 40% try and read more about different types of millets that can also be asked in the examination millet yield which is kg per hectare if we talk about millet andhra pradesh mein sabse zyada hai 2363 kilograms per hectare jawar is also andhra pradesh bajra is also andhra pradesh very similar jawar ka thoda zyada hai but bajra and millets are very close to 2300 anywhere between 2000 and 3000 kilograms per hectare that is the yield that we see in millets today in india okay when we talk about demand for millets we've already seen that because of a fall in per capita consumption there is not enough demand in india but the demand for exports is high because it is uh, consumed very heavily by certain countries we will talk about that also very very briefly when we talk about exports india is amongst the top 5 millet exporters of the world india exports about 75 million worth of 
millets and world exports around 470 million worth of millets today okay where does india export as per the annual report majority of our exports are going to uae about 18 percent and then saudi arabia next at about 14 percent ragi export hamare sabse zada nepal mein jate hain 89 percent that means ragi is used as a staple diet in nepal that is why they were importing heavily from india jawar exports to egypt and bazar exports to uae all the middle eastern countries still rel rely heavily on millets and that is why they're so fit so we should be moving from carb heavy diets like rice and wheat towards more protein based and fiber based diets like millets what are the top millet importing countries which import from india as well as the world china and japan japan humne socha nahi tha along with middle eastern countries which import from india globally japan is one of the highest importers of millet and we know about the life expect expectancy in japan probably this is one of the major reasons everybody knows about fish people normally don't know about the contribution of millets towards japan's life expectancy if we connect millets and sustainable development goals then sdg2 says zero hunger and food security and nutrition in drain fed and arid areas is automatically provided by millets so it contributes towards con uh, fulfilling the sdg2 of zero hunger if we talk about health how does millet contribute to a better health it has a low glycemic index which is good for people with high blood sugar levels so if you anybody in your family is diabetic then they should be consuming more millets dietary fiber minerals antioxidants and proteins these are found heavily in millets that's why they are more healthy to consume they help in fulfilling sdg3 if we talk about sdg8 responsible consumption and production then there is it provides output diversity how we are too focused on rice and wheat if we uh, divert some of that production towards millets it will automatically result in more diverse output of agriculture crops it reduces production shock risks which means if something goes wrong if there is a drought here if there is a famine here if there is a flood here then also millets are more have the potential of uh, withstanding that kind of a stress so the production shock risk is lower when you create diversity by uh, diversifying some of the land towards millets also that is how it contributes towards responsible consumption and production sdg3 and sdg sdg13 and sdg15 which are both connected with climate change it is a climate resilient crop we all know about that we have discussed that it demands minimal inputs in the form of water and it is more tolerant to diseases and pests so it demands less pesticides insecticides as well okay nabard recently along with university of agriculture sciences came out with raichur declaration in karnataka it's a place in karnataka they came out with some commitments now majority of these commitments are badi badi baatein but some of them are relevant we will talk about all of them briefly and in that we will understand what are the important relevant ones enhance production and productivity of millets that is very obvious promote entrepreneurship in millets promote low cost low capacity processing of millets now nabard has come out with some specific programs for these we'll be talking about these as well that is why this declaration is important it's not just for the namesake they're actually implementing these vision statements conduct millet challenge through atal innovation mission through which more and more youngsters can be made a part of this kind of revolution assistance of 25 crore from rural infrastructure development fund to university of agriculture sciences for carrying out research and promotion of millets this is also be done so these are the major uh, we can say commitments that have been made under uh, this raichur declaration okay promotion of millet based fpos nabard has promoted 132 millet fpos with grant of 30 crore so they are already working on the above declaration on the above commitments by coming out with such kind of programs and first one is fpos okay let's now come to the next chapter which is investing in a sustainable future now how can we invest in a sustainable future by uh, talking about climate action by investing in areas so that uh, we can mitigate and adapt to climate change number two 
by working on watershed development programs and number three by working on tribal development uh, uh, you know programs by creating fund and programs for tri tribal development these are the three ways through which uh, nabad is working by investing in these kind of programs it is working towards a sustainable future let's go through them one by one the first one is climate action what is nabad doing it is declared as a national implementing agency for adaptation fund under UNFCCC. A fund has been created for adaptation. There are two major uh, focus areas under climate change, adaptation and mitigation. NABARD is a part of adaptation fund and declared as the implementing entity. It is also declared as a direct access entity for green climate fund under UNFCCC as well. So it is basically implementing major programs under UNFCCC under these specific areas. When we talk about watershed development programs, then NABARD in financial year 2000 created watershed development fund with 200 crore, but till date they have already uh, allocated more than 2000 crore for watershed development programs and 3000 plus watershed development projects are going on through NABARD. Okay, so these numbers are important, they can be asked in the examination. Watershed is always a very favorite area of NABARD. NABARD came out with this Bhuvan portal, which is a web-based geospatial platform. What is the objective? To monitor intervention in projects under watershed development program. So, Jobi projects, watershed development program ke andar launch huye hai, unko monitor karna is the responsibility of this Bhuvan portal. This is how NABARD makes sure that whatever funds it is uh, allocating for watershed development, they are actually resulting in some substantial change. It came out with a uh, tribal development fund in 2004 and the aim is to provide sustainable livelihoods to tribal communities and reduce distress migration which is very important. We don't want people from tribal areas to migrate to cities. They can have a wonderful more sustainable lifestyle there and they need not crowd the cities. For that it created this tribal development fund. Okay, there is a lot of impact that tribal development has not only in those tribal areas but also for the sustainability of urban areas in India especially. Realizing that importance, NABARD invests in tribal development also. Okay, towards inclusive development, that is our next chapter. How does NABARD focus on creating a more inclusive development? Inclusive development means development which is not limited to certain people or certain class or certain regions in a society, society but spreads to everyone that would be inclusive development they've brought forward these focus areas number one by promoting livelihoods in all parts of the country by developing skills of the people by financial and digital inclusion by institution building building institutions creating institutes so that these institutes can work in areas and focus on empowerment of those specific areas entrepreneurship so that more and more startups which can promote inclusive development and sustainable development can also start providing research support and also by disseminating and sharing knowledge so it focuses heavily on identifying what can be done carrying out research and then sharing that knowledge with the people with the farmers with the rural areas so nabad is not limited to just agriculture finance and refinance and supervision it does a lot of these activities as well this also gives you an idea about the role of important role that NABARD plays. Let's talk about initiatives of NABARD in order to fulfill those objectives of inclusive development that we just saw. Number one, Vikas Volunteer Vahini. This was launched in 1980s. It is a farmer club at grassroots level. Volunteer Vahini, it is basically a farmer's club which provides support in the form of credit to the farmers awareness of technology, transfer of technology and capacity building of the farmers. So this works at the grassroots level and tries to empower the farmers by creating clubs for, uh, you know, consisting of these farmers. Second contribution or second major movement of NABARD is microfinance. Self-help group bank linkage program was launched in 1992 to provide formal banking and various other resources to rural women. Now this one is focused on rural women, self-help group uh, of rural women. 
Number three, skill building and entrepreneurship. There are three programs under skill building and entrepreneurship. These three are MEDP, LEDP, SDP. So they're complex, but they're very simple. MEDP is Micro Enterprise Development Program focusing on small, very small enterprises in rural areas. LEDP is Livelihood and Enterprise Development Program. So these are the prog programs which are focused on providing livelihood, not on empowering enterprises, but on empowering livelihoods by creating livelihoods, by making sure that people do not have to migrate for jobs. Third is Skill Development Program to make sure that people are skilled in the uh, rural areas whether it is a farmer whether it is a non-farmer in the rural areas they focus on these three medp ledp sdp all three are very important for nabad they have allocated 10 crore about 30 crore and 16 crore in this financial year and cumulatively agar hum dekhe to, uh, around 4 uh, 200 300 around 350 to 400 crore has been allocated cumulatively for these three programs okay or aate, what else is nabad doing a capacity building social stock exchange was created recently by NABARD. What is this? This is a stock exchange which comprises of NABARD, Sidbi, Bombay Stock Exchange, no, National Stock Exchange. 100 crores were allocated for creating this. What is the primary purpose? So that companies can come together, can list on this stock exchange and can raise money. So it brings investors as well as financiers and people who are looking for money together and empowers enterprises which are socially responsible okay so creating awareness about such enterprises capacity building of non-profit organizations as well as profit organizations in the agriculture sector especially bringing in investors and capacity builders on this platform so that they can know more and they can invest in such enterprises okay the next is capital catalytic fund Nabad created this with about with about 100 crore the aim is to support startups in the agriculture sector by creating incubation centers. So let's say you have a startup, you want to raise some money, you can get in touch with this incubation center, they can guide you, they can uh, tell you what to do, what not to do, and they can also give you money. So it's mentorship plus money that is often provided under incubation centers. Nabad has created this incubation center by itself. Okay. The sixth one is promoting GI products, geographical indication products are intellectual property rights of a certain region. Jaise ki laddu aata hai, koi, uh, uh, koi kapda aata hai, which is specific to a certain region. So protecting them and ensuring that their IPR is not violated through piracy and then giving them uh, exposure to national and international markets that is done under this uh, scheme of promotion of GI products. Okay, next is GI marketing outlets. So, Nabad has created marketing outlets for uh, exposure, more exposure and more space to these GI products. They created the first one in Varanasi and recently one in Ernakulam in Kerala to promote the GI products of these regions. Okay, what is Nabad doing for farm sector development? They've created a fund which is called as Farm Sector Promotion Fund, FSPF. This is focused on innovation in the farm sector, technology transfer and capacity building in the farm sector. These funds identify small farming areas which need help and then they provide them help either through the banks or directly as well through this fund. Okay, let's now come to the next chapter. How is NABARD ensuring enough funding for rural infrastructure? Infrastructure mein kya kya aayega? Bohut sari cheeze aati hai. Infrastructure is not limited to just irrigation, which is one part of infrastructure. It means roads, it means bridges, it means employment generation, it also means education, it also means tourism, okay, and it also means here you will see a lot of other areas. It means it also includes social sector, which means education and health, it means access to renewable energy. Rural connectivity, which we have already covered in and irrigation we have already covered. So these together form rural infrastructure. Okay, rural infrastructure. Mein, when we are talking about Nabard's contribution, then it's not only about irrigation; it's about all of these. So what is Nabard doing in order to promote and to fund rural infrastructure? Cumulative sanction under infrastructure financing. Uh, 
टिल डेट हैज बीन सेवन पॉइंट फाइव लैख करोर आज तक का सेवन पॉइंट फाइव लैख करोर हो चुका है रूरल इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर डेवलपमेंट फॉर आर आई डी एफ दैट वॉज द फर्स्ट वन क्रिएटेड इन नाइनटीन नाइनटी सिक्स द गवर्नमेंट ऑफ क्रिएटेड गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया क्रिएटेड दिस टू कलेक्ट प्रायोरिटी सेक्टर लेंडिंग शॉर्टफॉल ऑफ बैंक वॉट वॉज द एम टू फंड इनकम्प्लीट इरीगेशन प्रोजेक्ट यूजिंग दिस फंड इफ अ बैंक वॉज नॉट एबल टू provide loans under psl then it had to give the same amount of money money to ridf and this money was transferred to nabard which then used it to fund infrastructure in rural areas in financial year 23 uh, nabard received a total of 39000 crore under ridf okay the second one is rural infrastructure promotion fund what is the objective to help build innovative and promotional इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर इन रूरल एरियाज रूरल इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर को प्रोमोट करने के लिए लास्ट माइल में जो आपको छोटे छोटे इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर चाहिए नॉट ओनली इन इरीगेशन दो प्रोवाइडेड आर प्रोवाइडेड अंडर आर आई पी एफ ओके देन वी हैव लॉन्ग टर्म इरीगेशन फंड यहां पर आपको मीडियम एंड लार्ज इरीगेशन प्रोजेक्ट आर फाइनेंस बाय नबार्ड एंड बिकॉज दीज प्रोजेक्ट आर नॉर्मली कैरिड आउट बाय द स्टेट तो स्टेट या सेंटर जो है वो ही इनको फाइनेंस करते हैं ओके okay? The next we have is micro irrigation fund, which was created by Nabard in 2020 with allocation of 5,000 crore. Another uh, set of 5,000 crore is now under review. It might be allocated very soon. The focus of this is to provide resources for micro irrigation. छोटे छोटे irrigation projects आपको गांव में लगाने हैं. That is the objective of Nabard here. Infrastructure development assistance (NIDA) very very popular. nowadays it provides long term loans to state governments and uh, public sector entities which are doing good to finance rural infrastructure so yahan pe state ko finance karta hai and state state ko finance karta hai through nabard infrastructure development assistance and the state or these public sector companies then implement various projects for infrastructure development in rural areas okay nabard also provides fund for warehouse isko hum bolte hain warehouse infrastructure fund it provides financial assistance to state governments state owned agencies jo ki warehouse development ka kaam karti hain warehouses badhati hain chote chote areas mein jaake they are also given to corporates not only the government to do the same food processing fund the projected output in food processing by 2026 is about 535 billion dollars which is huge aur food processing ke andar kya kya aata hai jahan pe nabard provides funds mega food parks agro processing clusters food processing units and industrial food parks ye char major sub parts hain jiske andar nabard ek fund bana ke invest karta hai by giving it to state government by giving it to public sector agencies or corporates as well and then these units are created and by creating these units uh, in those rural areas wahan ke farm sector ko bhi modernize hone ka chance milta hai theek hai na so this is majorly about the nabard annual report ye jo pura pdf hai iska detail aapko niche mil jayega uh, description mein i will also try and create a more detailed video around the nabard annual report agar main wo create karta hu to main wo live dalunga in that report i will talk about all these numbers in more depth slowly and in more depth and we will also talk about the financials the balance sheet of nabard in more details there जिससे कि आपकी अंडरस्टैंडिंग नबार्ड एनुअल रिपोर्ट्स के थ्रू और ज्यादा कॉम्प्रिहेंसिव हो पाए सो दिस वाज ऑल इफ यू लाइक द वीडियो डू नॉट फॉरगेट टू हिट दैट लाइक बटन एंड इफ यू हैव एनी डाउट्स यू कैन पुट देम इन द कमेंट सेक्शन बिलो आई सी यू वेरी सून टिल देन ऑल द बेस्ट टेक केयर जय हिंद